Listen to the 48 Hours podcast for shocking murder cases and compelling real life dramas from one of television's most watched true crime shows. Go behind the scenes of each episode with award winning CBS News correspondents and producers in Post Mortem, a weekly deep dive. Listen to 48 Hours wherever you get your podcasts. Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, streaming January 25th, only on Netflix. A note to listeners. The following podcast contains content that may not be suitable for all audiences. Discretion is advised. I asked him, I said, what was the the moment, uh, or if there was a moment, with each victim that you were looking forward to, the, the moment that of, of ultimate satisfaction? You know, was it was it the, the kill per se? Um, was it was it abducting them? You know, what what was it that that, that you lived for? The fact that he wasn't able to control his impulses at times, and he and he simply was driven to kill and couldn't control it, I think bothered him a little bit. He referred to it as factor X. You are listening to Partners in True Crime. We are your hosts, Rob and Cindy Dorfman. Welcome back to The Killing Hour with Doc Bond. We want to thank the Partners in True Crime listeners for tuning in last week for the premiere episode. We had a great response to the first episode, and there's more to come with Doc Bond. Today, Doc Bond is going to take us deeper into the mind of Dennis Rader, or as he liked to be called, BTK. Doc Bond has been corresponding with BTK for his research, and as a result of that communication, BTK revealed many details about his mindset, methods of killing, and his feelings, or lack thereof, about the murders he committed. The purpose of this podcast is to get deep inside the mind of BTK so we can understand why he did the horrific things that he did in the hopes of possibly preventing future serial killings. Now it's time to dive into the world of BTK on The Killing Hour with Doc Bond. We're back with Scott Bond here on The Killing Hour, and today we're going to kind of dive deeper into BTK and find out what the pathology with uh, BTK and what he's he's done in the past. So, Scott, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's important to spend some time talking about his unique pathology and uh, what characterizes him as a particular type of serial killer and his motivations, etc. Because one of the, one of the things that is commonly misunderstood about serial killers is they're definitely not one size fits all. It's often thought that that sex is the uh, most likely the the motivation and that they all fall into a particular category. And that's just simply not the case. BTK falls into the category of it's the FBI classification of power and control killers. And what motivated him was the the need to dominate and control another human being. That was the the fantasy need that killing served for him. And and it's important to to note that the one thing that all serial killers do have in common is a fantasy need that is served by killing. Now, that fantasy need can be very, very different. In the case of Jeffrey Dahmer, it was purely lust and and sex. In the case of uh, the Zodiac, he was what was known as a thrill killer. It was the thrill of the of the hunt that turned him on. In the case of BTK, he's a classic power and control killer. What gave him the satisfaction that he was looking for was was uh, identifying a target trolling and stalking that target, then apprehending the individual, and then taking his time very slowly, tying up and torturing and um, doing all the terrible things that his mind could imagine with that individual. So it was actually the domination and and control that, that drove him. Now, is this something he, that he spoke to you about through the letters and stuff like that? Does he? Do you guys discuss his pathology? Oh, absolutely. I asked him. 
I said, what was the, the moment, uh, or if there was a moment with each victim that you were looking forward to, the, the moment that of, of ultimate satisfaction? You know, was it, was it the, the kill per se? Um, was, it, was it abducting them? You know, what, what was it that, that, that you lived for? And he said the thing that, that was his ultimate high, if you will, was the moment where he saw the, the life literally extinguishing from their eyes. He was a strangler. You know, he didn't he didn't exclusively strangle, but but more often than not he was a he was a strangler. Um, when he, he did that, did he tell you how he felt at that moment? Like what was the feeling for him? Was it a rush for him? Was it adrenaline oh, yeah, well, rush? No, that's exactly where I'm headed. He told me at that moment he knew he was God. Yeah, that was the moment that he lived for. And he truly believed at that moment that he was God because he was in charge of, of the decision of, of life and death. So yeah, in his in his grandiose and psychopathic mind, that is the moment that he was living for. So he was driven by this compulsive need to to dominate, control, torture, and maintain the 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 choice of life and death over an individual. But he also had a secondary need, and that was his fetishism, his, his sexual fetishism, and he would dress up in um, uh, these these individuals' clothes, sometimes take photographs with them. He was into sadomasochism, he was into bondage, he was into a number of different fetishes, and these would also give him tremendous satisfaction. But it was secondary. Uh, the, the, uh, the need for this gratification through fetishism was really secondary to his need for power and control. And he was not a rapist. He did not engage in necrophilia as some serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer did, but he would release himself sexually. He would climax many times after his killings. And he would do so while watching the individual either die or after they had they had died. So there was a sexual component to it, but it wasn't the primary thing. It was the it was uh, it was secondary in nature. Wasn't this he worried about leaving DNA evidence? Uh, no, and, and of course his the, the bulk of his killings were before DNA was really recognized and, and, and used. But that's ultimately how they got him. You know, after after um, the floppy disk episode where where they where they were able to identify his computer they then matched his dna that he had left at crime scenes with his daughter's D, uh, dna they got they matched it with familial dna and that's how they knew that they had him so no he was a little bit careless in in that regard leaving dna behind not fingerprints because again you know he knew he, he knew about fingerprints but but his killings preceded the uh, really the era of dna but that is ultimately was his his undoing. Now, you know the the thing about about BTK that's important to understand is, and we've we touched on this a little bit before, but he, but he really has two primary antisocial personality disorders that he fell into both categories. One is a, a psychopath, and also a malignant narcissist. And there, there's areas of overlap there. Malignant narcissism and psychopath um, overlap to the extent that both have very little regard for the rights of, of, of others and very little empathy. But what makes a psychopath a psychopath is the complete inability to empathize with another human being. They're just disconnected emotionally and any empathetic sense with other human beings. And if you think about it, that makes a um, pretty chilling predator, you know, if they have no remorse, if they have no a sense of guilt or um, shame, you know, for what they're doing, then you're pretty much a pretty perfect killing machine. And the, the power control killers, and there are other power control killers that I'm sure our listeners are familiar with, individuals like uh, John Wayne Gacy, Gary Ridgway, Ted Bundy, they are also power and control killers. So many of the highest profile killers that, that exist in uh, criminal annals fall into this power and control category. And they're particularly chilling 
predators because of this lack of remorse and the fact that they are psychopaths uh, and and just have absolutely no regard for uh, for others. And this type of killer, this power and control killer, falls into a category developed by the FBI called an organized killer. And some of the, some of the listeners may be familiar with that dichotomy of organized versus disorganized killers. The um, late FBI profiler Roy Hazelwood was the one who was credited with developing that dichotomy. And it's based upon the crime scene. How does the individual leave the crime scene? Is, is, it, is it an organized crime scene or is it a disorganized crime scene? And it, so what's, what's the difference between the two? A disorganized crime scene is where somebody like a Jack the Ripper just blitzkriegs an individual slices them to pieces and just lets them die right right, right where they are that's a, that's a disorganized crime scene an organized crime scene um like btk would have or, or or a ted bundy is oftentimes manifested in three different crime scenes where the person was abducted where the person then took them to kill them and then the third is where they would dispose of the body and in many cases uh, attempt to conceal the body. So where, where there is very little evidence left behind, where the body has been buried or um, a serious attempt to conceal it is what would be considered a, uh, an organized crime scene. And the FBI, the thinking and the philosophy and, and the uh, strategy behind this is that we can know a lot about behavior and personality based upon the crime scene and based how the on how the individual leaves the crime scene. Psychopathic individuals like BTK and Ted Bundy often are these power control killers that fall within the organized category of, of killer. And they, they leave very little to no evidence behind. And it makes them extremely difficult to apprehend and identify, even identify, let alone apprehend. But Real quick, how does, because it seems like it's people have different personalities and different mm -hmm. modus operandi just in their daily life. You know, some people are OCD, some people are sloppy, some like, so it's almost like BTK was kind of an OCD, obsessive compulsive kind of killer because he was very matter of fact and he was very particular on the thing. Whereas you said Jack the Ripper was just a slash and kill. How does that come about? Like when they're, when someone is developing, when a serial killer is developing, is it just that they're, that type of their personality kind of merges in like in the same way he's very particular at home and the way he kind of does his daily routine? Mm -hmm. Is that, does that transfer over? Because it seems mm -hmm. like, or is it just like this switch where they turn into a monster? There, There is a, a very much of a logic, if you will, to it. So somebody like a Jack the Ripper is much more likely to be mentally ill, unhinged, and just attacks like an animal, tears them to pieces and, and moves on. Whereas the, the BTK and the Ted Bundys are very meticulous and they're meticulous in their own lives, in their personal lives, and they're meticulous in their, in their killing lives. They, they, they're planners. They oftentimes, when BTK had his hit kit that he took with him, which consisted of ropes and guns and handcuffs and ligatures and, you know, every, everything that he might need in his sick endeavor to kill. And he would have contingency plans. He would have escape routes. He knew exactly what he was doing and he was well prepared. And, and yes, this is this doesn't come out of nowhere it is consistent with a very a personality type and people who knew dennis rader in his personal life and not knowing at all that he was the btk killer said that he was a you know a very serious meticulous control freak kind of guy so it was very consistent with his um you know with his with his personality and the psychopathy of this enables him not only to kill with with such disdain but it also enabled him to justify his his actions and to escape any sort of feeling of pressure you know so he for example he in a couple of his crime scenes he had to 
sort of make things up on the on the fly. And that happened in the, you know, his first killing with the, the Otero family, where he wasn't expecting to find so many of them at home. And it happened actually in his second attempt to kill later that year in 1974, when he went to the apartment of Kevin Bright and Catherine Bright. And he forgot his hit kit. And so he, his normal MO, modus operandi, would be to strangle, but he found himself in a life and death fight with Kevin, ended up shooting him twice in the face, and then stabbing his sister, Catherine, to death. Kevin actually survived. Kevin is the only one who to survive a BTK attack. He has permanent damage as a result because he was shot twice in the, in the face, but he actually saw Dennis and he told authorities that he remembered seeing the face of a man with what he said were psychotic eyes and a bushy mustache, which, of course, BTK had. How did he find those victims? Was he stalking them or how did he come in contact with them? Yeah, yeah. Well, in particularly with the Oteros, that was his first attack. And he had been stalking them for some time. The, I know, but the, uh, the people you were just talking about. Yes, yes. He would he would watch. He, he, he always would would troll in advance. He never he never just picked a house at random. Unlike someone like Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, who only picked houses at random. And part of the thrill for him was seeing who would be at home. You know, that was part of his enjoyment. No, BTK always would stalk his victims in advance. Did he say why he chose the, that brother and sister? I didn't talk to him about the specifics of it, about the, uh, you know, what was it about Catherine that, that attracted him? But he was not expecting to find Catherine and her brother at home. So it was the second time he was surprised by multiple family yes. members. Yes. He's very unusual in that, well, in many, many regards, but in it, to the extent that his MO would change. Normally, a, a serial killer will have a, a, an MO that they're comfortable with, like uh, the son of Sam you know, shot, you know, was a shooter. You know, he had his, his bulldog 44, and that's what he used exclusively. BTK's preference would be to strangle. And he loved the skin to skin gratification and, and, and being able to squeeze, literally squeeze the life out of, out of someone. He, he, that gave him tremendous satisfaction, but he would make it up on the fly when he had to and use a gun or, or a knife, you know, where it suited his purposes or, or became necessary. He would shift his MO as required. But he was able to adapt pretty quickly. And yeah, no, he, absolutely. He, he improvised absolutely. a lot. Yeah, but after Catherine and and Kevin, all remaining BTK attacks occurred, or or I should say killings, were a result of strangulation, because that really was his preferred MO. And, you know, the interesting thing, not all serial killers have signatures, but he did. And so the, the question might be, what's the difference between a modus operandi MO and a signature? All serial killers have an MO, because they have to have a way of killing. And they typically have an MO that they're comfortable with, once again, like shooting or, or strangling. So an MO is what you have to do to kill someone. A signature, if it exists, is something that, that exists purely to serve the fantasy needs of, of the killer. And so, for example, BTK would torture, bind, torture, kill. So part of his signature was tying these individuals up in very meticulous fashion. And he was a master of knots. He, he, had, um, he had been a Boy Scout and he learned knots. His favorite was the square knot. That's actually how they linked his crime scenes originally was through the ligatures, through the, through the use of the square knots. That was the first indication that they, you know, it was the same individual who killed the Oteros and Catherine Bright. But he took it further not just the 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 binding and uh, with the ligatures, but the but the torture itself, which he would do meticulously, and so this was part of his signature. And interestingly, whether he knew it or not, when he named himself "Bind, Torture, Kill" in the letter that he sent in late 1974, he was giving himself a brand name that consisted of both his MO and his signature: "Bind, Torture, Kill." I don't know whether he you know he was really aware of that, but. He was telling us what his, both what his, uh, you know, his MO and, and his signature were. Did he ever um, explain that to you in like your letters to him, like why he decided to do that? Why he decided to give himself a, a, a brand name? Mm -hmm. uh, he gave himself a brand name because he was jealous 
of the notoriety that some serial killers had received, including Jack the Ripper. And of course, his murders overlapped with Son of Sam. He, he started killing before Son of Sam, and he ended much later than Son of Sam. And, and BTK was extremely jealous of the amount of attention that that David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, received. Now, of course, he was in New York City, so you know he got so much, you know, the lion's share of the you know media attention in New York City. But he was very, very jealous. In fact, he created his own little BTK signature to compete with the occult sign that that David Berkowitz left in in some of his letters at, at the crime scene, and. I asked him about David Berkowitz, and he had complete disdain toward David Berkowitz. He said, David Berkowitz is not a man. He's not a real killer. He would shoot from a distance. Real men get up close and have skin-to-skin -skin contact and strangle. So he had just complete disdain toward David Berkowitz. But I believe there was, as I said, a, a real profound jealousy there, too, for the acclaim that he had. So he gave himself that brand name because he wanted notoriety. And when he hadn't received sufficient notoriety in 1978, he sent a letter and he actually asked for it. He said, how many people do I have to kill before I start getting some national attention and some real notoriety. He was upset. He was angry that he hadn't received what he thought he was due. And you said he stopped killing for about 13 years. Is that correct? His last killing was 1991. And then he was caught in, in 2005. But he came out of he came out of seclusion, so uh, sort of, or, or came back into the spotlight in 2004. Okay, so he went about over a decade without killing anybody. What That's triggered right. him to go back and do it again. Do you know? Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. There were multiple factors. One was, and, and probably the, the one that you could point to the most, is on the 30th anniversary of the Otero murders, which occurred in 1974. So we're talking about 2004. The Wichita Eagle, the big paper in, in town in Wichita, ran an article like, like, BTK, where are you? You know, and it was speculating that he was dead or, or, or you know, just went away or disappeared or something like that. And that irked him. You know, he he wanted to let the world know that I'm still alive and well. And he said he also had been very much considering killing again, wanting to uh, to kill again. And he actually had his eye on someone. He said he actually had someone that he had been watching. So that was the thing that I think that precipitated uh, that really, you know, brought him brought him back. It was his ego and he missed it. He missed the attention. I believe that he got a tremendous amount of gratification out of carrying that badge as a city compliance officer, which he did between 91 and 2004. So I, I don't think there's any coincidence that, that that same time frame, he was able to exert control over individuals as he would go into their homes and tell them to cut their lawn and, and put their dog on a leash and you know all these sorts of things. He carried his badge and, and that he got off on that. He definitely got off on so that. So that gave him his fix, that control it did, fix. It did. And I believe that that, that sustained him in, in many ways. That combined with his auto um, erotic fantasy and masturbation and you know reliving the uh, the murders. You put that all together, and I think that's what sustained him. But it was just too much when they speculated that he was gone, and 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 you know he had to tell them no, 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 no. I'm, you know I'm I'm still here. I'm alive and I'm alive and well. The one thing that I think is interesting thing to consider is. Why, you know, he, he did this autoerotic fantasy. He, he, would, he would vividly relive his killings through his trophies and the, the, the things that he would collect from his murders. And then he would relive his fantasies. And he said that sometimes that that was enough, you know, that was enough to give him the satisfaction that, that he needed. And then he could just go on about his life. Well, if that's true, then didn't he know at some level what he was doing was wrong, you know, that, 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 that he was actually trying to control his impulses? And I actually believe that he was, because this, this is a man who is the ultimate control freak. And the fact that he wasn't able to control his impulses at times, and he, and he simply was driven to kill and couldn't control it, I think 
bothered him a little bit. He referred to it as factor X. You may have heard of this term. BTK is pretty well known for talking about this impulse to kill called factor X. He didn't know how to describe it. He didn't know what to call it. It was just this irresistible urge that at times would be so insatiable that no amount of autoerotic fantasy, no amount of, of uh, reliving his crimes would satisfy him. He would have to kill someone new. And when it came over him, he, as I said, it was insatiable. He called it factor X because he didn't, he, t he told me, he said, I don't, I don't understand it myself. Well, I actually think at some level in his psychopathic ego, it irked him. That, that he didn't understand it and wasn't able to control it. So I think that though there actually were attempts that was he was attempting to do that. But <laughs> in classic psychopathic BTK fashion, he has to flip it around and tell me and tell the world how fortunate we are that he was able to sustain himself through this autoerotic fantasy, or he might have killed much more frequently than he did. So we should be grateful. Society should be very grateful that he was able to, uh, to do this. He told me that in no uncertain terms. Do you think that when he's, because he wanted so much attention, he wanted to be Brandon BTK, to me that just is kind of dangling a hook in someone's face saying, catch me, catch mm -hmm. me, catch mm -hmm. me. Talk a little bit about why serial killers brand themselves and basically want to be caught. I would say that he, he did not want to be caught, but he loved the game of catch me if you can. And he developed a relationship with Ken, Ken Landwer, who was head of the uh, BTK task force that they put together in 1984. And he was the one who ultimately, you know, ultimately caught Raider in 2005. So it was like 20 years of back and forth and cat and mouse. And Raider loved it. He absolutely loved this game. And he thought Landwer loved it too. When he was caught with the floppy disk, BTK was aghast. He said, you know, Ken, how could you lie to me? Didn't you want this to go on forever? You know, our game? And Landwer said, no, I was trying to catch you. Of course I lied to you. And in BTK's strange psychopathic principled world of principles that only he understands, he thought that Ken had dishonored their friendship, their relationship. He said, Ken, we're fellow law enforcement officers, you know, referring to his carrying a badge as a compliance officer. So he had, he thought he had just been completely betrayed. But to, more to your question about, you know, why do they, some of them do this? Not all serial killers do this, but some of the most prolific and infamous do. And it just adds to the excitement of the game. It demonstrates to BTK, hey, I'm, I'm the smartest guy in town. You can't catch me. Not, not only do you not know who I am and that I'm killing, but I can even give you clues. I can send you information. I can send you puzzles and games and clues to, to find me. And you can't find me because I'm smarter than you are. So it just, it, it heightened the excitement. Well, it's also and, a control because he's controlling the narrative. Absolutely. So that's absolutely. another way that he could manipulate everyone and control of and course. be the puppet master of what's happening. Yes. Look at me. I, I am in ultimate control and speak. And, and in that regard, Cindy, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I asked him in one of our letters, I said, I said, is there a moment that's, that stands out to you, you know, where, you know, cause I, he's so grandiose about his, you know, about his accomplishments. Is there one thing that stands out to you above, above all others that you're gained the, the most satisfaction from? And he wrote back to me, he said, yeah, absolutely. He said in 1991 was the year that I received my badge as a city compliance officer. And this was like a lifelong dream to be a officer of sorts. And he had to go down to city hall in order to get his badge. Well, guess what? While he was there receiving his badge, they asked him, would you like to see the BTK war room? Would you like to see where, you know, we have all the evidence and everything to, you know, catch this terrible serial killer? And he said, of course, I'd like to, you know, I'd, I'd like to see it. So he went in there and he was just, I mean, a kid in a candy shop couldn't have had as much fun um, as he had. And uh, because there he was, unbeknownst to them, the man that they were looking for, they had just given a badge to, and they were uh, they were walking him through the BTK war room. It can't get more ironic than that. And I, what was uh, their reaction after the fact, after they caught him and they realized what they well, did? Well, let me let me just let me just finish the the story. Uh, he he told me. I, I said, "How did it make you feel?" And he said, "What a rush!" 
and exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Law enforcement, after the fact, when they realized they had, he was right underneath their nose the whole time. Oh, well, they had their first session and it was it was like old home week for for BTK. It's like he was holding court. He said to them, you know, Ken, you've been you've been trying to catch me for the longest time. You were unable to. And he 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 said, I was only undone by the by the floppy disk. And it's only because you betrayed me, you know, that that this happened. So there was a bit of ego jousting in um, even their their first session. He's so grandiose. He said to Ken and, and the other detectives, he said, it's obvious that we're going to be here for a while. So if it's okay with you, can we just put BTK on my coffee cup so I know which one is mine? You know, uh, <laughs> he wanted his own personalized coffee cup because that's who he is, you know, and it's all about me now. And, and in, so rather than be sad, uh, for lack of any better word, about being caught he, although he felt betrayed and he was a little bit angry at Ken Landwer for, you know, for in his mind, betraying him. However, it, it gave him a new stage to stand on. So even though now I'm, I'm caught, now I have an opportunity to tell you how I fooled you for the last 30 years. Look what I did. Look, look what I did. You, you had absolutely no idea that I, was, that I was here in this town under your very noses and you were giving me a badge and you were making me the president of the Lutheran church, you know? So it allowed him to bask in his, his glory. So it just gave him, it gave his narcissism and his psychopathy something new to feed on. Yeah. But what was like, my question was, is like, what was the reaction of the law enforcement that he was right underneath their nose the whole time? The, nothing, nothing public, you know, I mean, they didn't come out and say, oh, gee, you know, what idiots we were, you know, we're for, you know, not, not, not catching him. So nothing of a, a public nature. It was more the description of his demeanor once he was apprehended. Well, to be fair, it's it's similar to Gary Ridgway. I mean, there wasn't DNA analysis. We didn't have the technology back then that we have now. They didn't have those tools, law enforcement at the time. Had it been now, right. we would have been caught straight away. Yeah, but that's I right. mean, to be fair to law enforcement, it must have been very frustrating for them to have him be right there in front of them. I can imagine that must have felt awful. Yeah, because they swabbed Gary like years beforehand when they you know because they called him in twice before past mm-hmm. three polygraphs but i guess mm-hmm. the last time they had him in they swabbed him but they did the technology didn't catch up until about literally 2001 it was like right mm-hmm. after 9 11 and that's mm-hmm. you know and they 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 had that and they also had some paint from the peterbilt truck place where he he was he painted trucks and mm-hmm. it was on his clothes and so mm-hmm. they had those things that really connected the dots for them but you know they mm-hmm. were looking at him for a long time they just couldn't prove anything Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. my question to you is going back a little bit about the bind, torture, kill thing. Was that the, the whole thing, the bind, the torture before the kill? It, was that all the foreplay before so he can, until he can gratif- gratify himself? Was that the foreplay for the kill? There are two kinds of, of serial killers in terms of the murder itself means to them. There are act-oriented serial killers who are focused on the act of killing itself. And then there are process-oriented serial killers that it's all a about what leads up to the kill. And BTK is very much process for the point of distinction. So the you know, uh, listeners understand wh- wh- where I'm headed with this is someone who kills David Berkowitz is a very good example of a serial killer who is focused on the act of killing. It wasn't the process. He was a shooter. He did it from long, long distance. He wanted to kill. He needed to kill. That is the thing that, that drove him. Now, in his case, he believed it was a message from Satan to kill, but it was fo- the, 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 the thing that he needed to do in order to satisfy his relationship with Satan was kill. So shoot him and we're done. In the case of BTK, no. Process of killing is the thing that really gave him the satisfaction that, that he was looking for. So it was all about the trolling finding the the individual watching them getting to know their routine and then apprehending them subduing them tying them up and torturing them that was that was all very much part of the process and that led up to the killing itself and as i said for him the orgasm was extinguishing the life from the individual watching the light go from their eyes but not because of the act itself but of everything that had preceded it so in that regard i mean i think you could use the analogy of foreplay but foreplay being 
really the goal as opposed to as opposed to the, the kill itself. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's what it seems like. It seems like he had a, a recipe. It was like a, Ab- a routine. Absolutely. It's like, you know, he's going, all right, well, I'm going to break in. I'm going to bind them. I'm going to torture them. I mean, that whole, that whole time frame, how long did it take him to do that? It could be hours. He would take time when he was alone and he was able to. There were times where he was, things didn't go as he had planned, like with Catherine and, and Kevin Bright didn't go as planned. Another time that didn't go as planned, he killed a woman, Shirley Vian, and she had three children, actually had three children at home. And he was interrupted. The phone rang and it became a chaotic scene. And he just left after he killed Shirley. Now, he has said, if given the time and if things had gone differently uh, as planned, he would have certainly killed at least one or more of the children in addition to uh, Shirley. So so he got stressed uh, out because it was too chaotic. His, his, yeah, yeah. He had it disrupted make, he had his make, um, routine. It, that's right. That's right. His routine got because got he was so methodical. It seems like that he had this idea in his head, and it had to go according to plan and controlling every element. And, and if so, something oh yeah. was well, thrown re- in, you he know, he would rehearse in it in advance. I mean, mm-hmm. he the narrative. I mean, he had he was it was like Alfred Hitchcock, you know, sketching every uh, every scene of a of a of a movie, and in, you know, in his in his legendary sketchbook, it was the same thing with BTK. He he would fantasize and think about every detail in advance. Which is why, once again, that for these kind of serial killers, and Bundy said the same thing, that the fantasy, the thrill of the fantasy was always greater than the reality of it. Because they would build it up to such a plateau in their minds preceding the kill that it was just impossible for the reality of it to ever live up to their, you know, to their fantasy, which is what drove them to kill again, you know, again and again. Did he ever say that, what was his feelings after the fact, after the adrenaline dump happened? Was there any kind of remorse, depression or anything? Certainly not, not remorse. That's it. You bring up an interesting question because the, the cooling off period between murders that, that any serial killer has, it can be from days to weeks to months, and in BTK's case, years. It's generally assumed that that the uh, the cooling off period is just that. It's a coming down from this almost like a narcotic high and then blending back into the nor- so, so-called normal world or seemingly normal world and going about your activities and so forth. But for BTK, he had these lengthy cooling off periods that really became more like ritualistic planning periods he what he would do is he would begin to very slowly try to identify the next victim and and watch them and it and it became sort of a foreplay so these cooling off periods were actually periods of escalation and fantasizing and would lead him to the point where he would reach a tipping point and couldn't stand it anymore and, and had to act on it. So the the, uh, the normal cooling off period for a serial killer is a little bit different than than him. It's 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 almost it's almost unheard of to have these gaps between murders go on for years. You know, I mean, literally, he he killed in 1974. He killed in 1977, 85, 86, and 91, okay? Those were, and then he was captured in 2005. So think about that. I mean, it's, it, we're, we're talking years and years in between these uh, murders. So very atypical as cooling off periods go with, with serial killers. Is that what he explained to you, though, that what, in between those periods, he was just kind of pining and fantasizing on what the next thing is? and Absolutely. And Looking like pushing the down next- the urges and... You know, how- looking for the next perfect victim, looking for the who, who is the next one, who's she going to be, and and let's watch her and take detailed notes and and learn everything about her. It was all part of the escalation and the fantasy that leaded up to um, the kill itself. He would fantasize on end about what he was going to do to her. You know, once he identified her, so absolutely, um, it was it was a big part of the process. And, and, and that's why I say he is a classic process killer. Not an, He's not an act-oriented killer. He's a process-oriented killer. Did he ever, like during that period, that, that cooling off period or that planning period, did he get to a point where he was trolling someone and didn't follow through on it for a variety of reasons? Like, you know, it, did, it wasn't matching up with all his boxes that he was lining up in preparation? Well, there, there was one 
episode. In 1979, he had been watching a woman by the name of Anna Williams, who was a retiree, and he was planning to kill her. And in fact, he thought he understood her schedule. He broke into her house and he was waiting for her, but she didn't show up. And he waited for a long time until he finally decided, I'm, I'm not waiting any longer. And you know what he did? He went through her house and he took some personal items. And a couple of months later, he wrote her a letter and, and, and mailed her personal items back to her. And he wrote her a little poem. Anna, why weren't you at home? You know, where were you? I had something so special planned for you. And sent her these personal items. And, and actually, she was completely freaked out. And he signed at BTK? He didn't. He didn't. So they didn't realize that it was BTK. So they found out. How'd they find out? He told them? He told them, yeah, later on. And as I mentioned uh, a bit earlier, they didn't know that BTK really was BTK and a serial killer until 1978. And it, and it had not been released to the public because they simply hadn't linked the, the killings yet. It took years for them to realize that the Oteros and Catherine Bright and Shirley Vian were all linked. They just didn't know initially. That's crazy. That, that last story is crazy where he sat there and waited for her and she didn't show up and complete, he was completely disappointed, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and enough so that he actually wrote her a poem, you know, about how disappointed he was that she didn't show up and didn't allow him to do all the insidious things that he had planned to do. As he got older, he started to target older women, probably realized that physically he, you know, he just wasn't as adept and strong and agile as he was when he was younger. And so some of the, his later victims and intended victims, like this woman was in her 60s, Anna Williams, and his the last woman that he killed, Dolores Davis in 91, was also in her 60s, whereas some of his, his earlier victims were in their 20s and, and 30s. It's crazy. He's adapting even to his own aging. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And Does he still have know, those urges now? I mean, now he's been in prison for a long time. He has fantasy needs, but he they, they're played out differently. You know, he he knows he's not going anywhere. He's not he's not an idiot. He he knows he's never uh, getting out of prison. So his need to fantasize has not dissipated, but it's simply redirected itself. And so he has has fantasies now about things like investments that he says are, are like a narcotic. They're like a drug addiction to him. He meticulously follows the stock market and real estate. And in his mind, he, he has created a fantasy portfolio of stock and other securities and real estate investments that, that he has created in prison that he says has made him a, a wealthy man. So he continues to fantasize, but he's just you know, retargeted it in a, in a way that he can manage it and, li and live it out. You know, I mean, the, the stock market is a bit of a high for a lot of people, uh, the highs and lows, the ro roller coaster ride of securities and stuff like that. So it's not surprising that, that he would be drawn to that. And he is able to enjoy it real time because he does have access to TV and newspapers and things like that. So he can follow the markets and trends and so forth. So that's as close to a, a high as he's able to get. So it's right. almost like he, he's, he's a gambler. He likes to gamble. Oh yeah. Oh, high, big time risk taker, big time risk taker. Thrill, the thrill of it all. The, the catch me if you can, the here's a clue, see if you can find me. He's always looking for ways to escalate the, uh, the, the, the thrill with, without a doubt. And he told me he's he, he, the, the same as the, as the need to kill was like a narcotic high and a narcotic addiction. The, the, his real estate preoccupation and his stock uh, preoccupation is like a narcotic high. He said the, the same thing. So it's, he's finding other ways to, you know, to experience those things. And when you talk about BTK and you talk about all of this to the average person, you say, well, isn't he insane? Isn't, you know, isn't this, isn't this man just, you know, completely insane? And I suppose in, in layman terms, you know, in terms of literally abducting, torturing, and, and strangling the life out of someone, that seems rather insane, especially when you're doing it over and over again to complete strangers. But the, the important thing to understand, and I, and I try to, especially when I teach classes and stuff like that, I try to make, make this very clear to, to um, my students, is that BTK, as crazy as he might seem, is neither insane in a clinical sense or in a legal sense. He simply does not fall into the, the, the insanity realm in either case. In the case of, of clinically, he 
is not mentally ill. He has been diagnosed with multiple antisocial personality disorders, narcissism, psychopathy, sociopathy, borderline uh, personality disorder. These are, these, are, these are not mental illnesses for which there is any cure. They are antisocial personality disorders that are actually incurable, but they're not mental illness. It is not the basis for an in insanity defense. And the reason for it is BTK and Bundy and John, John Wayne Gacy and rattle off all the big brand names, they're not insane in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a legal sense. They know exactly what they did was wrong. They, they know right from wrong. They, they, they know the rules, but because BTK is a psychopath, he doesn't care about the rules. The, the, the rules of society, our rules, social mores and norms mean absolutely nothing to them. He has complete disdain. So the mere fact that, that killing is not only morally wrong, but legally wrong, it just, it's not gonna deter him. It, it, it means nothing to him. And, and in order to be temporarily insane in a legal sense, you have to have been in such a state that you didn't know that it was wrong to kill at the exact moment that you killed. Not five minutes before, not five minutes after, but at the exact moment you killed. And that simply doesn't apply. It just, you know, to most of these guys and BTK in particular, it just, you know, it just doesn't apply. So the legal definition of insanity doesn't apply to him and the clinical definition of insanity doesn't apply to him. It does, um, are, is he being treated with medication since he has all these conditions? So he doesn't take anything? No. No, yeah, like just uh, no, not at all. And and but you bring up another interesting point, is this seems almost like a contradiction, but a psychopath like Dennis Rader is actually very manageable in a prison setting because he is so goal oriented and reward oriented. They manage him by offering him little treats. You know. Uh, Dennis, if you have no infractions this week, you don't break any any of the rules, you're going to get an extra serving of chocolate pudding on Saturday. You're going to get an extra order of French fries or a milkshake or something like that. He lives for this stuff. When we started corresponding in 2010, he had already been in prison for five years. And he told me he was so proud that he had never received even one infraction. He had not broken one rule. And as a result, he was getting all his chocolate pudding and his, you know, and his hamburgers and French fries. Um, so, so they it, were, it, he's it, able to be programmable. They program because like, he's manageable. That's the thing. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, that's manageable. what it's all about with inside, you know, prisons is you have to get into a program. They program exactly. everybody. So he's highly manageable. He's highly manageable. And he looks forward to those rewards. Now, he's also isolated 23 hours uh, a day. And he's only allowed out in the fresh air one hour a day with a guard, with an armed guard. And he never leaves his cell without restraints. And that's not only for other people's protection, but it's also for his protection because if Raider was in the general population, he wouldn't last very long. They call him baby killer, you know, because he, he killed, a, you know, Josephine Otero, young girl. They refer to him as baby killer there in the... Um, yeah, and everybody want, everybody inside prison would love the opportunity to put that in the notch in their belt. Take oh, yeah, the scalp to, for your belt, like you said. I'm the guy who took out BTK for sure. So yeah, so he's he's isolated for his own protection. You know, he's he's the master of his little domain there. As long as he's got his puzzles and his books and people like me to write to. And by the way, the uh, the paradox that I was contributing to his something interesting to keep his mind going. I mean, that didn't escape me as I you know as as, as I was corresponding with him. But that's what he lives for, you know. And he, and he's also manipulative. He would, you know, he would give me little threats in in letters. Like, like he said, he'd say, you know, I'm giving you special information, special insights that other people don't know about. So you better not be talking to CNN. You know, I better not hear that you're on CNN because something might happen. And uh, he was always looking for ways to manipulate and control.
Fascinating. fascinating. Completely fascinating. This was amazing, Scott. Thank you so much for yeah, and just, all of this analysis of BTK and his psychopathy tendencies and making us understand his motivations and his MO. And I think I think the next step, I think we're gonna we're gonna start talking to some other people have had interactions with him. People I believe one of them was uh, one of his jailers who used to Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Jenny Grantham, former corrections officer who literally gave him his breakfast in the morning there at Elder. Colorado prison. Looking forward to talking to her. Yeah. Yes. So. Great. Thank so you so we'll much. We'll do that the next time. We're going to try to set that up with her. And thank you so much. And we'll uh, we'll talk to you then. All right. Fantastic. Next time on Partners in True Crime. But yeah, he was just talking about all the letters that he wrote every day, the letters that he was getting. He'd get maybe a milk crate full of letters every day from all these people that he's writing to all around the world. All rights reserved. This has been a production of 722 Media Content.